So let us stand together in unity, in one accord, and let's lift our hands to the Lord this morning. Lord, you are so good. God, we thank you that it was you that woke us up this morning, that it was you that saw it fit to give us the mercy of opening our eyes and stepping out of bed and pursuing what it is that you have for us this morning. We thank you for that beautiful weather earlier this week. And we thank you for the rain that washes all things new. And Father, let us be able to look past those clouds, what may seem to be the gloominess outside, the gloominess that surrounds us, and allow us to understand that above those clouds, high above everything else, that you are seated in heavenly places and that sun shines brighter than anywhere else, Lord. We sing these praises to you this morning in Jesus. We give you all of the glory, honor, and praise. In your son's precious name, amen? Amen. Amen. Amen.
presence in this place today, God. Hallelujah. 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 Church, he is so good. He is so faithful. And he is so wonderful. There aren't enough words to describe him. And how awesome is it that the blood of Jesus can cover everything. Everything. There's nothing too big for him. Amen. Let's give him a shout of praise right now and thank him for the blood. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus.
Hallelujah. Come on. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. You know, I was glad when they said, let us go to the house of the Lord. Come on, don't got any happy people in the house today? Come on, where are all my happy people at? Amen. You know, I've made up my mind I'd rather be happy than sad. Come on, happy, 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 happy. As you lift your hands to the Lord, Father, I pray right now you begin to sweep across this room. Lord, I pray that you do exceedingly, abundantly more than we could ever think or imagine, God. Father, we love you more than ever. We are so grateful for all that you're doing. Lord, I pray that your mighty power would just begin to descend upon this room. Father, I pray that we'd receive kingdom principles that are change our lives forever. Hallelujah. Change our families. Change our destinies. I pray debt-free in Jesus' name. Lord, I pray right now you just begin to do your work in your hearts of your people this morning. As we lift our hands, we surrender to the King of glory. We attach ourselves to the kingdom. Hallelujah. We are kingdom players for this end times harvest, God. Lord, may you use us to reach people that are far from God. We thank you now in advance for all that you're going to do in our hearts and in our lives today. In Jesus' name we pray and all of God's people said. Amen. Come on, let your amen be the loudest in his house this morning. Amen. Hallelujah. You may be seated. Praise the Lord. Man, we've got a very special treat. Give this worship team a hand. Amen. Come on, Crossroads Worship, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, yeah, they're playing a lot better than you're clapping. I'll tell you that much. Come on, let them know how much you love them here. Come on, they get here at 5 o'clock in the morning, preparing, getting ready to serve you today. And uh, we are grateful for all that God's done with you. You guys are amazing, amazing, amazing people. Hallelujah. I want to read to you something very special. We're in a sermon series right now uh, called For Thine is the Kingdom. And we're learning kingdom principles. How many know that it's different than earthly wisdom? It's heavenly wisdom. And we talked last week about it's, it's not only uh, we have the ability to bring heaven to earth, but it's a kingdom of power. And today we're going to be talking about kingdom economics. It's a lot different than worldly economics. Budgeting is good. But how many know that a, uh, an overflow is better? What's an overflow? That's having more than you need. Amen. We're talking overflow. I want to read to you uh, Dr. Rodney Howard Brown. I don't know if you're familiar with him at all. How many appreciate Dr. Rodney Howard Brown and all that God's doing with him down at the river? You know, and sometimes you'll read something, but then it'll hit you in your spirit. And this is back in February. God began to speak to him and, and about the conference that just came up called The Flood. Uh, our teams just went down there, our entire worship team and all the people that are connected there. How many went with you? Fifteen. Fifteen people went down to the river. Hallelujah. It's funny, you go to a flood to catch on fire. You can figure that one out later. Anyways, but uh, I was down there and Dr. Rodney, I mean, he had shared this earlier. I mean, I, it wasn't the first time I heard it, but it hit me in my spirit. And I'm going to bring it back home to you. Can someone say amen? amen? And I've learned this, that revelation is contagious. Revelation is contagious. And he began to share out of Second Chronicles chapter 31. And I'm going to begin reading to you in verse 2. In our kingdom victory cruise that we're having, how many are enjoying their victory cruise at Crossroads? Right? And, you're, and the, So what you're going to do is you're going to be talking about these kingdom economics in your victory cruise this week. It's important that you don't miss your victory cruise because every week you're getting these kingdom principles that you can apply r immediately in your life. How many know that you're filled with kingdom's power? The power of God is on the inside of you. And so we've seen miracles last Sunday. Hallelujah. How about, I remember the woman with the cane. Left with no pain. Amen. And is here today. Amen. How, how are you feeling? Yeah, she's a good. <laughs> Come on, let's give them a hand. Hey, God, because you can get it and you can keep it. And so uh, we're going to be talking about these kingdom economics in our, in our victory cruise this week. And we have one of the most amazing men of God. 
that God has blessed us with that he's revealed so many things. He's written 52 books on the area of finance. How many want to attach themselves to kingdom principles? How many know when God blesses you, you get really blessed? It's different than man blessing you. A man can only take you so far. God can take you all the way. Amen. And so he'll cause an overflow in your life. And so here uh, the, the king Hezekiah is given instructions to the people of Israel and Judah. And I want you to listen to what he says. It says, Hezekiah then organized the priests and the Levites into divisions to offer burnt offerings and peace offerings to worship and to give thanks and praise to the Lord at the gates of the temple. The king also made personal contribution of animals for the daily morning and evening burnt offering, offerings, the weekly Sabbath festivals and the monthly new moon festivals and the annual festivals as prescribed in the law of the Lord. In addition, he required the people in Jerusalem to bring a portion of their goods to the priests and Levites so that they could devote themselves fully to the law of the Lord. There is a law of the harvest that whatever a man plants, that will he also reap. So if you don't sow, then you don't reap. It's the law of the harvest. And the law of the harvest says you will reap more than you sow, later than you sow, and more than you know. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, God's principles are true. That's why we're teaching and we're taking these six to eight weeks on these kingdom principles. I want you thinking kingdom thoughts. When you're going through your day and you see something, I want a kingdom thought to come into your mind. How many have seen something and God began to reveal something to you out of you read out of his word? Like you'll, you'll notice something and you're like, oh yeah, oh, that. and then God starts giving you a download on the kingdom. I want you constantly thinking kingdom-minded thoughts so that you can do kingdom-minded things to help get people into the kingdom. Right? How many know that we are agents for God? Amen? And so it's amazing what God will do with us if we allow him to use us. And so here the King Hezekiah has given very important instructions to the people of God. I love what they said. You're going to hear one of the most amazing messages you've ever heard on tithing. Dr. John Abenzini is in the house this morning. Can someone say amen? <laughs> and, and has written 52 books on the area of kingdom economics. How many remember some of his books? 30, 60, 100 full. How many remember uh, good, uh, Rich God, Poor God? It's amazing the revelation this man has got. He's been all over TBN and with Paul and Jan Crouch. We are blessed and through our relationship with Bishop Rick Thomas have been connected with probably one of the greatest teachers on prosperity this world is known in our generations. Come on, how many are blessed to know that we've got something powerful in the house of God tonight? How many want something for your children's children? How many want revelation for your children's children? Something that'll last forever in your family. And so I'm, I'm looking forward to the teaching today. We was just with us in the first service and powerful, powerful. But so Hezekiah then organized the priests and divisions to offer uh, peace offerings to the Lord and give thanks to the Lord. It goes on to say in verse 5, it says, When the people of Israel heard these requirements, they responded generously by bringing the first share of their grain, new wine, olive oil, honey, and all the produce of their fields. They brought a large quantity, a tithe of all they produced. Did you catch what it said in the scripture? It says that they brought a large quantity. That was the tithe. In order for them to bring a large quantity on the tithe, they must have had something large to bring it from. How many want to see increase in their lives this year financially, spiritually, emotionally, economically? Like, like all of it, just increase. How many want increase? Then you need to learn the law of the harvest. And so anyways, it goes on to say, it says, when the people, uh, it, it, a, a tithe, they brought a large quantity of the tithe of all they produced. Verse 6, the people who moved from Judah to Israel and the people of Judah themselves brought in their tithes of their cattle, sheep, and goats, and a tithe of the things that had been dedicated to the Lord their God, and they piled them up in great heaps. Heaps. Did you catch that? 
You know, what's funny is I, I, I grabbed Pastor Roberto uh, and brought him to dinner with me and, and Dr. John. Uh, we were at a birthday party. I had to go. I just said, hey, you want to come with me? He said, yeah, absolutely. So we went to his house. He said, I got to change real quick because he doesn't want to go to uh, paparazzis with Crocs on. And I said, hallelujah, amen to that. So I called Dr. John. I said, we're going to be a few minutes late. He says, fine. So we get over there anyways. And uh, I get to his property while he's changing it. He's got firewood all over his property. And he's got it piled up everywhere. He's got it like a stack off by the back by the back area. But then he started piling them up on his walkway that goes around to his house. I'm like, why do you have that piled up there? He goes, all these piles represent different types of season that the wood was in. I'm like, just put it all over one spot, right? Well, I guess, no, he wanted to know what's ready to go and what's not ready to go. <laughs> but it's just so funny that I was getting ready to share this scripture, and I'm going there, and he's got piles. And, man, I just feel like in my spirit, as you stand right now before the Lord, I pray that as those piles would, there's other kind of piles that begin to happen in your life. And I pray that it comes on you now in the name of Jesus as we get debt free. There's piles that would begin to mount up on your property. Amen. I pray that you find a gold mine on your property. Now, they live on a, on a tree farm. There's trees. There's Christmas trees everywhere. And I come into agreement with what you said to me yesterday. Amen. They're going to give you that piece of land that's right next to your house. Amen. I believe it. I prophesy. How many believe in the prophecy, right? Now, I, I don't call myself a prophet because I'm a pastor. <laughs> Let's get that straight. But I do believe that as we speak the word of God, the word of God can manifest. And so I'm believing God with you. What came out of your mouth, I'm in agreement with. Amen. That God will give you that land next to your house. How many know that we can come into an agreement? Hallelujah. And that whatever we loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And whatever we bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. How many know that's a Matthew 18 principle from the word of God? Let's put scripture in the driver's seat of our lives. Does that sound like a good idea? Yeah. And so they, they, they said that they, a tithe of all they produced, the people moved from Judah themselves, and they began to give a tithe, and great heaps began to pile up on our property. They began piling them up in the late spring. How many know that the late spring is over, and we're in, like, summer now? God, I don't hear nobody. It says, then they began piling them up in late spring, and heaps continued to grow until early autumn. Oh, my goodness. Is anybody receiving this word this morning? Amen. When Hezekiah and his officials came and saw these huge piles, they thanked the Lord and his people, Israel. Where did all of this come from? Hezekiah asked the priests and the Levites. Come on, how many know they're offering shock the man of God? It shocked the man of God. Where do these come from? Oh, with every hand raised up in this church, I pray that as people begin to bring their tithes and offerings to this church, in obedience to the word of God, I pray that there would be piles, piles, heaps, heaps that had caused to ask, what is going on with your people, God? And Lord, I pray that I know that you've got to get it into their house before it ever comes to this storehouse, God. I pray that your people would be so blessed that they'd bring in their tithes and offerings in heaps and piles, God, for your glory in Jesus' name, and all of God's people said. It says, they asked, where did this come from? Oh, man, this is so good. And Hezekiah asked them, and Azariah, the high priest from the family of Zadok, replied, since the people began bringing their gifts to the Lord's temple, we have had enough to eat and plenty to spare. The Lord has blessed his people, and all this is left over. Hallelujah. God caused great multiplication to happen for the people of God. He's a multiplying kind of God. Can someone say amen? And so we are grateful. As you stand up on your feet, I just want to pray over your life that God would just begin to bless you so abundantly it caused unbelievers to ask what's going on with your life. Your, I pray that your anointing is so strong not just in the area of finances, but in every area, that people would want to get prayer from you, people would want you to pray for them, that they would see the light of glory all over you. And you know, and as you connect to the kingdom, I pray that every kingdom principle, every kingdom 
uh, principle be, would begin to work in your life as you begin to step in faith for the kingdom of God. In Jesus' name, and all of God's people said, Amen. Now I want you just to pull it down from heaven. Just pull it down. I know we do this, right? But all good and perfect gifts come down from the Father of lights. And you can pull it down through obedience now in Jesus' name. You may be seated for one more second. I just wanted you to stand for the kingdom of glory to receive the anointing of God. I believe God and his word. And so we're going to receive our offering. As they put these offering buckets out here, we've got a short video for you to see. We've got a video, right? And then uh, the worship team is going to come back. But we've already prayed over the offering. I'm going to pray in just a second one more time. Just that God would bless it. He would bless you. And you would see heaps. How many want to see a heap for just a tithe? Oh, God, I'm not interested in money. Well, then you'll never, money will never be interested in you. <laughs> you. You know, you've got to believe. Let me tell you what your finances do. Your finances help us keep these lights on. Come on. Your finances will help us get debt free in Jesus' name. Your finances help pay for our staffing. We've got pastors that are here. We've had pastors that actually had to work a secular job while they were ministering, Right? But you should never muzzle the ox while it's treading grain. And so we take care of the ministers here at Crossroads Community Church. But not only that, we do outreaches. How many know that every year we've gone into the city and we've made, we've flipped this city upside. Fitchburg's better because we're here in Jesus' name. We've, we've, we've painted the, the, all of downtown. We've painted the gazebo. We've painted buildings. We've, we've redone the schools. We've got, how many know that we've touched these school systems here for the glory of God? We fix stuff that they don't want to fix. We provided carports so the kids don't have to stand in the rain. I don't hear nobody waiting for to get picked up, standing soaking wet. We put carports so that at least they get out of the rain. Every single one of those teachers thanked us at that school down there hallelujah at crocker they thanked us thank you for doing that crocker school sent us and all the kids did a special little thing where they all wrote us notes powerful we're changing a community i said we're changing a community i'd say fitchburg and the property values are going up hallelujah crime is down hallelujah crime came to a cease when we had our revival meetings we knew somebody that worked at the Fitchburg police office says that the switch, the dispatcher didn't get any calls while we're having. Come on, I don't hear nobody. That's because of the anointing of God. You are the anointing. You are the light of the world. And when we step onto the scene, things change. I said things change. And so God's been doing amazing things with this church and his people. And I believe that the best is yet to come. But your finances help us. We're going to Roxboro, North Carolina. We're sending a crew down to do street witnessing, flyering for a big tent meeting down there that the evangelist Ted Shells. We're going to send a whole team. You know what's sad? Africa has to send missionaries to the United States of America right now. We used to send missionaries to Africa. And now Africa sent him. I just, we just had one that was in a service last week. I said, I'm going to give you $1,500. We're going to help you. He's got to go around and strengthen these churches that have been devastated by COVID. Come on, how many know that, that Christ is over viruses and diseases? Help these churches. There's still churches that aren't opened up right now. We've got a family that's got a, Franklin, is it? Had to travel out for this no church that they, they, they could go to in Franklin. They had to travel. They seen us on, online. They said, we're coming here. I just met a man in the first service from Worcester. So said, we've been watching you online. There's no church like I've seen online here. Nothing like that here. Come on, how many know God's doing something special on this holy mountain? This is Mount Zion. This is God's special mountain. This is where the anointing of God. The evangelist Ted Shuttlesworth told me that this is a porthole for New England. A porthole of blessing that God's going to pour out. The happy angels of New England are laughing right now at the devil because of what he's tried to do to the church. How many know that the devil tried to divide the church last year? But you know what we're going to do even more this year? Unite the church. I said, we're going to unite the church. We're bringing people together for the glory. I had everybody lock arms on the first service. We don't have time. 
Because if I, we go late, the, the, the kids' church downstairs are like... And it's true, you know, it's a little different being up here in the thick anointing than, you know, dealing with the, you know, the kids downstairs. Hey, Amen. Those are your kids, by the way. But for the glory of God, they serve because they love Jesus. Aren't you thankful? And this is the things that your money and your ministry does. It helps. Your money is a ministry. I always ask anybody, how many ministers do we have in here? you got like seven people raise their hand. How many ministers do we have in here? Come on, your ministry, to, you, you got your ministry to your wife. You got your ministry to your children. You got your ministry to your neighbors. We've all been given the ministry of reconciliation according to Romans. We are all called to bring people into the kingdom of God. And that's why we're doing our victory cruises. So you can start, start thinking kingdom thoughts. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever saith the Lord. Let's give the Lord one more clap offering. Father, we thank you for the ability to give into the kingdom. We're thankful that we have a storehouse, these beautiful walls with these sound panels, these wonderful lights, these amazing singers, these great lights, these all these wonderful instruments. We know that there's churches out there that meet on wooden and gravel and dirt floors, but we've got carpet in Jesus' name. We've got stairs and we've got ushers. And we've got a parking lot for the glory of God. We have been blessed, but Lord, we know that we are blessed to be a blessing. Father, may we get it right so it goes right. In Jesus' name we pray. And all of God's people said, Amen. Now this is what's going to happen. We're going to watch a video. As soon as the video's done, they're going to sing, and you can bring your offerings to the Lord.
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It is my great honor to introduce one of the greatest men that's walked this worth in our generation, Dr. John Abanzini. Glory to God. Thank you. Remain standing a minute or where, just stay where you're at. Let me look at you. Yeah, tell that person near to you that Brother John thinks it look real nice. Now, little Texas, give it some Texas, real nice. Give it a little nice, real nice. Y'all, you may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Praise God, we got a light. I, I was, you talk about a preacher in the dark. I was a preacher in the dark this morning. Uh, <clears throat> I'm going to bring a, a, a unique word to you this morning. We're going to see that we're going to see this uh, sharing the increase is what I call the message. We're going to see it from the book of Revelations all the way into the, uh, from the book of Genesis all the way into the book of Revelation. We're going to see God speaking of sharing the increase with Him. Now the message I bring you is going to be of little value to you if you don't believe the Word of God. If you believe the Word of God, there's going to be great assurance that's going to come to you from what you're going to hear. And especially if you're a tither, and if you're not a tither, I think it'll be a, you'll, you'll see some things here that'll make it just a very, very hard not to be a tither. Not from a point of what we need money, that's not the issue. The, the message of biblical economics is not in the Bible to get money from God's people, it's in the Bible to get money to God's people. And the tithe is a wonderful thing, and that's so fair that if nothing comes into your life, nothing is owed to God. But if, if a dollar comes in, then a tenth percent of it comes in. If a dime comes in, one penny goes to him. If a hundred thousand dollars comes in, uh, I don't even know how much is that. A thousand dollars goes to him. I know how much it is. All right, let's begin. I begin with a simple thought. God wants increase for all of his children. And we go to the scriptures, Psalms 84, 11. For the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. Now that's not a hard verse to figure out. 
No good thing will he withhold. You can, you can easily tell the difference between a good thing and a bad thing. I look back in my life, the uh, <clears throat> first place we rented was not a good thing. My wife and I, when we first got married, it was not a good thing. It was a, it was a tough place. You couldn't get it warm. You couldn't get it cool in the summer. And then uh, there are places now that I'm living, it's a good thing. And it's, I, I can tell the difference. You follow what I'm saying? So God is saying here, it's not a hard thing to figure out. Does God want you to have a, a, a something just a little better? God wants you to have the very best. Amen. He doesn't mind you having the very best. And you'll see that in just a moment. That, well, uh, it's brought out here in the Apostle Paul speaks it. Uh, in Romans the 8th chapter, the 31st and the 32nd verse. What shall we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? Now listen to this. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Now think with me about this. Do you, do you think that uh, God would say, I'll give my son for your uh, salvation. I'll give him, crucify him on the cross. But as to that new car, no, uh-uh. no, that's a little too much. Can you say? You see the comparison? If he, if, he did, if he gave his son, there's nothing that would be too valuable that he would say, no, that's too much for you. Now, there is a time for things. You understand there's a time for things. Uh, I, I take just another minute. I, we're not playing up against the parking lot this time. But uh, we don't want the, the downstairs church to come up here and get us either. I better stay on the subject. Let's move right along. You know, increase was one of the first things, uh, commands God gave to Adam. In Genesis 1, 27, 28, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God created him, man and female created them, and God blessed them. Now that right there, if it just was nothing else, he just blessed them, uh, that, 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 that's wonderful. But it goes on. It says, God said unto them, be fruitful, that's wonderful, and multiply. Now there's the number, multiply. That's the way that progression comes. That's the way increase, mammoth increase will come into your life. If you can get beyond just addition and you can get into multiplication where the blessings are multiplied back to you, where there's not just a little bit left over, like uh, you, we heard pastors speaking on the heaps and they said when it was all done, there was plenty to spare. I tell you, there's nothing nicer than surplus at the end of the month to have surplus. Well, what are we going to do with this? Well, we put this in savings. Well, what are we going to do? We could put it all in savings. Well, no, we're going to do this. We'll have some fun with it. We'll do some other things. God says there's nothing too good that he's not willing to put into your life. But here's what you have to understand. It's not luck. It's not luck. It, it comes through a process. And, and, and that process, if you go to the seed time and harvest, sowing and reaping, and if you operate under an open heaven, with the tithe, you'll find that these things will start happening in your life. They'll start happening in your life, the things that God promises. And please know this. Sometimes in the most difficult times, you have to make decisions sometimes. Is it going to be this or is it going to be that? Am I going to, am I going to go ahead and, and uh, put this money that I was wanting to put in this place or am I going to pay my tithe? And it's a hard decision. But let me say, I've heard preachers say, well, you know, you, you can't lose your car or something like that over it. I've never had to lose a car over tithing. Now, I lost two cars over not tithing. I had repossessed. <clears throat> and I, I swear to God, I had two houses repossessed, not tithing. So, I mean, I, I am, uh, uh, in the past, I've been a real deadbeat. But I was a non-tithing deadbeat. Because when I started tithing, I came out of that. And I started having abundance starting to add itself into my life. So, anyway, we find there that, that at... Uh, as, as he said, be fruitful. And when he said multiply, there is the power thing. If you can get multiplication to start working in your life, uh, it, it absolutely starts just stacking up and stacking up and stacking up. And then <clears throat> we go down to uh, uh, <clears throat> the first, uh, I got to watch it. I don't get ahead of myself. Increase was on, uh, was, he spoke it to Adam. And then the first record of God's plan of increase uh, in Genesis uh, 2, 15 and 17 through 17 the Bible tells us that the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. Now those are two labor intensive words. He wasn't in there in a hammock waiting for the stuff to grow. I mean, if you wanted to work, you get a hold of farmers and you'll find out they're working from sun up all the way till sundown and on into the night. And many times just by candlelight or by lantern, they're working. It's, it's, it's hard work. But then comes the harvest. And whenever they said they dress it and keep it. And by the way, I want to bring this to your attention. The garden that God, uh, that they were in, God didn't 
create that garden. You understand? Did you know that he didn't create that garden? He planted the garden. You see, if he'd have just created the garden, he could have just said garden and he'd have a garden. But then he's turned around and he wants us to live by seed time and harvest. And he did not, he, he did not introduce, he would not put us in the plan of seed time and harvest for our living and for our prosperity if he hadn't first proven it. He tested it. He started God said, if I'm going to have my people live by seed time and harvest, I'm going to have to see that it works. And he planted a garden and day after day, season after season, it finally grew up. He put Adam in that garden. And when he's there, God lays down some rules. Genesis 2, 15 through 17. And the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden to dress it and to keep it labor intensive. And the Lord commanded the man saying, of every tree of the garden, I must freely eat. He said, you've worked for this. You've planted it. You've both stowed your labor on it. Now you can just eat of it. But we're going to have to share some of the increase. There's going to be some that you aren't going to be able to eat. He looks and he says, but of the tree of the knowledge and good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day thou eatest of thou shalt surely die. Now, are you picking up what's happened here? I mean, just eat, just enjoy, have a good time. But there is a portion of it that when the increase comes, that it's not to be taken and eaten. It's to be put and separated to the Lord. Do you see that? It's the beginning. It's the very foundation. You know, many times we get, we get teachings and, and the, it's, it's fuzzy about the foundation, where the foundation is. But I'm showing you right here the foundation where this sharing the increase started. It started in the Garden of Eden. It started with Adam and Eve. And God clearly laid it out to them. Now, <clears throat> Cain and Abel come along. Now, two things about Cain and Abel. One, they had great parents. Adam and Eve were great parents. Now, you, you, you usually feel kind of, maybe they were lousy folks. They got us in all this trouble. <laughs> but I tell you what they did, though, that I tell you what they did that's real hard to do. They raised two sons, and both of those sons gave a portion of the increase to God. D do you get that? Now, now, here we have immediately Adam and Eve, they did it. Boom, they're two boys. Boom, they're sharing the increase with God. Because the Bible says in Genesis 4, 3 through 4, and in the process of time it came to pass that Cain brought the fruit of the ground, an offering unto the Lord. And Abel also, he brought the first things of the flock and the fat thereof to the Lord. And the Lord, and Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. Now both sons gave a portion of the increase back to God. That's not hard to understand, is it? It's, 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 it's just plain fair. That God puts, for, for instance, take a seed, just a seed. Take, a, take a, a kernel of corn. And you take the budget of this nation, every, every, the amount of money that they spend in one year, and give it to the laboratories of the world and say, could you make me a kernel of corn that will reproduce corn? And they can't do it. They can't do it. They can put all the chemicals together. They can bond it in a certain way. But they can't breathe life into it to where it'll reproduce and then reproduce and reproduce. And let me say this about hundredfold. A lot of people say, "Why well, that's so hard to think of a hundredfold. Every time a grain of corn is planted, you have not a hundredfold, you have three hundredfold. I mean, there's more than a hundred grains of uh, grain, kernels of corn on an on a ear of corn. I mean, get, get, just look at seed time and harvest. Get this multiply. God wants you to take your money and quit looking at it as money, but start looking at it as seed. And when you drop it into the ground and you put that into the things of God, God says, I'll bring it forth 30-fold, 60-fold, and 100-fold. 100 100-fold 100 is not hard to understand. A hundred times is not hard to understand. Some could be come back a hundred times. Uh, are you picking up what I'm trying to say to you? All right. Now, the main thing, I don't want to lose sight of this because I can go on a lot of tangents here. We're going to march right straight through, and we're going to see we're going to see sharing the increase in every dispensation of time. Now you go, the portion that we see Cain and Abel did it. Now uh, we come to Noah. Now Noah's a very unique situation. Noah is a boat builder who becomes a farmer. He brings into the ark seven of clean beasts. Genesis 7, 1 and 2. And the Lord said unto Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark, for, for thee have I seen righteous before me in the generation of every clean beast thou shalt take seven by uh, thou shalt take thee by sevens male and his female and those will go onto the ark two by two now watch what happens here these are now of the, of the unclean beasts they came just a pair a pair of camels a pair of um, leopards uh, uh, male and female but now with the clean beasts now this is what can be eaten this is what's clean and what he could eat 
So he now is standing there at the end, at the beginning of time when that ark lands and he unloads that, that, that ark. He has seven pairs of every animal that's edible. He is now, without realizing it, from just over the time of that flood, he has now left as a farmer and he lands the richest man in the world. He owns <laughs> every edible animal in the world belongs to him. And the first thing he does, now watch it, the first thing he does is he, he sets aside a portion for God. Uh, and we pick that up over in, uh, uh, oh, wait a minute, I'm going to get away from that now. He, he offers it before the Lord uh, that uh, uh, all those of the clean animals, one-seventh, he takes a one of each pairs and gives it to the Lord as an offering. You see what happened? He had an increase, so he shares the increase back with God. Is that reasonable? That's so reasonable. I mean, you, you, just, let me just look at this just a minute. You, you, you got a job. You're able to work. Now, now, now watch with me. There's another fellow over here. He's not able to work. What's the deal? Here, you're blessed. You're blessed with a body that'll work. You're blessed with, you got a job. You have a skill. And now, uh, at any moment, that could just change. Just like that, it could change. I mean, you could have a, you could have a heart attack, boom, and you'd be out of the program. But God has you healthy, and you're working, and you have increase. Now, this guy over here is not having increase. I mean, he can't work. He can't, can't, can't hardly put two thoughts together. But now, when the increase comes, then you want all of it for yourself. What, what's going on in there? Something, there see, if, if, when that was happening in my life, I was so blinded, I couldn't see how ignorant that was. That's just ignorant to do that. Are you, are you grasping what I'm saying? Yeah. Now, 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 think this thing through. Every time the increase comes, God wants a portion of it. He just wants you to set a portion of it aside for him. And it goes on from uh, Noah and uh, in, in, uh, <clears throat> in, in Genesis 8, 20 and through 22, the Bible says, And Noah built an altar unto the Lord, and he took every clean beast and every clean fowl and offered the burnt offering uh, on the altar. And I'm going to stop with that portion of the verse right there for just a moment. Now watch what he's done. God has asked that the increase, you tithe the increase. So that's when a cow has a calf and, uh, uh, and you, you have a group of cows you take and you tithe on that. If you have chickens, you tithe on that, on that increase. But these had not brought forth the increase yet. They had not brought anything forth yet. They had generations and generations of, of clean beasts that come forth from their loins. But he gave that and not only did he give that animal that he gave, but also all the animals that would have ever come forth from that union right there. Are you picking that up? Yeah. Probably the biggest offering that there is in the Bible outside of the offering on the cross. Look a little bit further. Oh, and this is, I've got to put this in. It doesn't have anything to do with biblical economics, but I'll put it in. And the Lord smelled a sweet savor. Let me ask you this. How many of you like the smell of burnt flesh? You be somewhere in a, uh, and somebody's somewhere or the other, a, a uh, a, a dead dog or a dead animal has been thrown into a fire and you got, you smell that stink? But God likes the smell of burnt flesh. He likes it. <laughs> here's, here's the verse. Second Corinthians 7, 1. Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves of all the filthiness of the flesh. God likes it when you burn up that flesh and you start walking in the spirit. Oh. Okay. Detour over. Okay. Back, back subject. Noah shared a portion of the increase with God. Now, 2,500 years passes. 2,500 years since Adam and Eve, and they continue. You can see the record. They continue to make the offerings, do the different offerings. Now, this thing that we're calling sharing the increase, the Lord Jesus comes in the form of Melchizedek, and he gives it a name. It's no longer just sharing the increase. He names it. And that happens over in Genesis 14, verse 17. And the king of Sodom went out to meet him, at, meet uh, Abraham, after he returned from the slaughter of Chedorlaomer and the kings that were with him in the valley of Sheba, which is the king's dale. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. And he blessed them and said, Blessed be Abraham of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. And, he, and blessed be the Most High God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thine hands. And he gave him tithes of all. 
Now we have a definite name. We have a name, and not only do we have a name, but we have a quantifier. It's going to tell us how much that share should be because that word tenth means, that tithe means tenth. So, and you say, well, I thought you said that was Jesus. Well, in Hebrews 7, the first verse, starting with the first verse, we see that Melchizedek was in fact the incarnate Christ, the pre-incarnate Christ that has come and uh, meets Abraham there because here's the description of him in Hebrews 7, 1 through 3. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the most high God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all first being by interpretation king of righteousness, and after that also king of Salem, which is king of peace. And then it goes on, it says, without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of days, being made like unto the Son of God, abideth a priest continually. Now here we see that when this thing got named, this sharing the increase, when it got named, it wasn't named by some preacher. It wasn't named by some committee. It wasn't a denomination that put it in. But the Lord Jesus himself comes in the form of Melchizedek and he gives a name to this thing called the tithe. And now people say, well, you know, it's Old Testament. It's just that and the other. Well, no. See, because Jesus Christ, we're told in Hebrews 13, 8, we're told Jesus Christ, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's consistent. And when he said that, the, when he said that this is the tithe, he meant that this is the tithe and he doesn't change his mind just because ministers or theologians have put some kind of a dispensational break in the process of time and say, well, tithing goes here, but tithing doesn't go over here. You're going to see that in every, every dispensation of time, every division of time in the Bible, you're going to see that it breaks down and there's a sharing of the increase that takes place. And it'll amaze you when you get down into the last, second to the last chapter of Revelation and you're going to find it still going on. Let's go a little bit further. Now, Moses, the Mosaic law comes along and uh, when you get to the Mosaic law and uh, you'll see in Leviticus 27, 30 and 31, the tithe is incorporated into the law because I'm, I've heard preachers, you, you can get them right on the television. You can watch it, they'll, they'll be right on the television. They'll tell you that the tithe uh, is, is for Old Testament and now we're in the New Testament so it's no longer tithing. But that's not the case at all. It's, that's, that's not at all because uh, the Old Testament, uh, the, excuse me, the uh, law, the law was 300, four, 340 years, I think it was, 430. 430 years tithing was established through Melchizedek. It was the sharing the increase was established by God in the first chapter of Genesis. And now we come down to the point that we find that the law incorporates the tithe. It incorporates the tithe. And with the tithe incorporated now, we come to find also a unique thing about not tithing. It's a, it, this is not good news, what I'm going to read to you now. In Leviticus 27, 30 and 31, the Bible says, And all the tithe of the land, we're just going to read the 30th, 30th, 31st verse, All the tithe of the lands, whether the seed of the land or the fruit of the trees, is the Lord's. It's holy unto the Lord. And if a man will at all redeem aught of his tithe, he shall add thereunto the fifth part thereof, 20% penalty for not tithing. Now, don't get mad at me. I didn't put that in the Bible. i tell you the truth. I probably wouldn't have put it in if I was one putting. I mean, that is, I mean, we got enough pressure on people just to get them to tithe. Now you're talking about a 20%. No, I wouldn't have put it in. I would have voted, no, let's don't put that verse in. But there it is. I mean, and if you're not a tither, can you imagine over the years and not tithing month by month after 20%, 20%, 20%. But the blood of Jesus Christ, you can take that, you can, you can take that problem to the cross and you can walk through the cross and through the blood and you come out the other side of it and that all be done. You won't have one penny that you owe. Just start tithing and God will pick it up right wherever you do. Do, do, do you get what I'm, do you want to say? Okay. Now, moving a little further. Uh, let's get, uh, okay, Jesus now, at the, at the, you come down to the end of the law period and you're coming down now just before the church period begins, just before Jesus dies on the cross and in the end of that time, he's still talking about the tithe, the sharing of the increase or people tithing. And in Luke eleven forty two, 42, 
But woe unto you, Pharisees, for you tithe mint and rue and all uh, manner of herbs and pass over judgment and the love of God. These ought you to have done and not leave the others undone. He says you ought to tithe. And that the word ought there is a very unique word. It's uh, di, D-E-I, di in, uh, in, the, uh, 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 in the Greek. And it means it is necessary. It behooves you to do it. It's required. It's the right and proper thing to do. Are you grasping that? <clears throat> it's a necessity. Now, this is, not, this is not some preacher saying it. This is not some, some, some denominational uh, rules and order. This is the Lord Jesus Christ saying at the end of that church age, this ought you to do. You ought to tithe. Now, we come into the church age. Jesus dies on the cross. He raises, ascended back into heaven, accepted there, seated at the right hand of the throne, and many, many preachers now are teaching, well, you don't have to tithe anymore. The law's over. It wasn't part of the law. But now, what is the, did you ever wonder why someone would be telling you on the radio or the television <clears throat> or in some church you don't need to tithe? Yeah. It's, just, it's just to find some other way around into your pocket. You, you follow what I'm saying? And a lot, and I, 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 I'll just take a break a minute from the subject. I have run with televangelists from one end of the earth to the other. And thank God for all the gospel they preach. But when they start trying to tell you not to tithe in your local church, but that you can also tithe to them, you better back away from that person real quick because they're more interested in your money than they are in your soul because that, the church is where the tithe goes. The church is where the tithe goes. <clears throat> I, I, I built, thank you. I built, I built a great ministry. We, 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 we had worldwide, had offices in Australia and Asia. We had offices in Uppsala, Sweden. All over the world we had offices, 70 employees. And I became a rich man in that, in that time. And you say, you're saying you're rich? Well, what kind of a fool would you be to sit up here and listen to a poor man talk about money? <laughs> That'd be like listening to have a lost man try to tell you how to get saved. Yeah, I'm rich. I, I, I'm poor. I've been poor. Now I'm rich, and I like being rich a whole lot better than I did being poor. It's just, if you, if you don't, it's a truth. I'll, I'll swear to that. You're going to enjoy being wealthy a whole lot more than being poor. And you can be poor. You can have more money. There's no place in the world like America where you can have money out the kazoo and still be poor. And you know what it is? It's debt. Debt. Now tonight we're going to have a war on debt meeting. We're gonna, I'm going to show you what the Bible says about breaking the power of the spirit of debt and becoming debt free. <clears throat> How to get debt free. So uh, tonight, okay? Oh, I was going to give you the definition of debt. Here's the definition of debt. It's emptying out your future to fill up the present. Listen, I've been young and now I'm old. 21st day of this month, I became 85. And uh, I, I could have probably, I, I made it all right poor when I was young. But poor ain't an old man's business. I would not like to be old and poor. God help us. I mean, and then you say, well, Brother John, I am old and poor. Well, make up your mind that you're going to start putting these principles to work in your life and God will take and he'll, 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 add, he'll restore the years that the canker worm has taken. He'll still can see you into a prosperity if you'll just start using the principles. It's just like saying, well, I'm old now. It's no sense getting saved now. I mean, it's right there for you. And, and, and I've, had, uh, I've had one of my fellows that became a, a, a minister, a, a prison evangelist, uh, he said he was way up in years. He was in his 70s. He said, I'm too old to be a minister. I said, no, you're not. I said, get out there and do it. And God will add years to your life. If you've got a plan for God, God will move things around where you can have some more years to get it done. He'll restore the years that the canker worm has taken. Oh, and well, Brother John, you don't understand. I, I messed up. I can't really serve God because I, I had a divorce. Lord, there's a, the first woman of angels had five divorces. That woman at the well, she, she, she went into town preaching. She went, uh, I met a man, come see. 
Come see this man. Can you imagine that woman, the way she must have lived in that community and all of a sudden there's a man that knew everything? Some were going to the meeting, some were running from the meeting. <laughs> now, <clears throat> now, the church, the time, we, let me get back on my subject. The cross, Jesus says tithing is right up to the time of the cross. After that, many are teaching you don't have to tithe anymore. But it's in the Bible. They were still tithing. 35, let me give you the exact numbers here. From 65 to 75 A.D., the book of Hebrews was written. From 65 to 75 A.D., so 70 to 75 years after the death of Christ, this book's being written, and Hebrews 7, 8 says, the writer says, and here, and the word here is, uh, it means right here and now in this place where I stand. It fixes time and geography. Okay, it says, and here men that, tie, that die receive tithes. 65 A.D., the writer of Hebrews, which I believe was Paul. Some have other ideas. I believe, I believe it says there that at 65 A.D., men right here and now in the presence of this writer were giving, were receiving tithes. But there, and this speaks of another time in another place, he Receive them of whom it is witnessed he liveth. That was when Melchizedek received that. Are you grasping this? Now, we've gone from in the garden. We find in the garden, God says, you're to share the increase. We find that's what, uh, and that's what got, the, that's what got uh, Adam and Eve in trouble. They didn't, they didn't do what God said. They didn't share the increase. They went ahead and ate of that fruit. They took that which was set aside for God and used it to themselves and messed up everybody's life since that time. But they did some things right because their two boys, their two boys were givers. They gave to God. They shared the increase with God. And then we go on down further and we come to find Noah. Noah, whenever he lands, he has all these animals now. He now is the richest man in the world. He shares one-seventh of all of those edible animals he offers on the altar to the Lord. And then you come on down and you come to find that when um, Abraham comes back from the teaching comes back from the slaughter of the kings. Uh, we find that Abraham now is met by Melchizedek, who we saw is the reincarn is the is the incarnate pre is the pre incarnate Christ that has come now and speaks there. It's called a theophanies, really, as they appear like that, and a tithe is taking place there. Then we come on down and we see that it's incorporated into the law. Then we see Jesus speaking that even in the church age, there's tithing taking place. The book of Hebrews tells us that right there in the presence of that writer of Hebrews, it was taking place. Now then, we come to the end. The second coming takes place. There's a new heaven and a new earth. What's going on in that new heaven and new earth? You're going to find that the increase is being, is being shared again. Revelations 21, verse 3, 1 through 3. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. And there was no more sea. And I, Josh, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned with her husband. And, and so we, we, we set the date. Where are we at in Revelations 21? We're in the new heaven and the new earth. And the 23rd verse says, And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it. For the glory of God did light it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. And now get this, the 24th verse, and the nations of them which are saved. Child of God, there's enterprise taking place out there. It's not, listen, when, you know, you see how the universe is so just, just in, uninhabitable, scorched, boiling, uh, dead. Listen, angels had a war. Angels had a war. And when it was over, the universe was destroyed with that. Can you imagine angels fighting? And then God takes earth and he takes and he just tilts it a little bit so that we get seasons. And as soon as you get seasons, seed time and harvest will work. And he starts off again. And now he brings that to a close. New heaven, new earth. It's a whole new thing. But now something's going on. There's nations. There's nations out there. I can't explain it, but the Bible says there's nations of people that, that, are, that are just just. Through, and probably not just in the earth, but probably through the whole universe is populated. And that's speculative on my part. 
Uh, it's not, that, that's not in the, in the, that I find exactly in the scriptures. But something's going on that there's all of a sudden this population of people that are not the kings and the priests because you see the kings and the priests coming and they're bringing offerings into the new Jerusalem. Watch it here. And the nation, the 24th, that are saved, 24th verse, walk in the light of it and the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it. And now we're going to look at glory and honor in just a minute because that that word honor is a tremendous word. It's going to amaze you when you see what it is. And uh, the 25th verse, And the gates of it shall not be shut by day, for there shall no night be there. And they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it. These words here, glory and honor, that word honor is the word time, time in the Greek. And it means money, namely money. The first definition that it has is money, the price of something. Are you picking up what I'm saying to you? I can't explain it to you. But if you're one of the kings and the priests in that time and you're going to come into the city on regular intervals and you're going to bring treasure into that new Jerusalem, I can't understand. But I do know this, that God multiplies. And I do know that increase is going on wherever he's at. We're not going to be sitting around on a cloud asking Paul what that thorn in the flesh was. We're not going to be sitting around all kind of goofy ideas that people have about heaven. And, oh, God help me. Don't let me get in that. No, I'm, I'm t- I mean, well, I'm getting my mansion. What do you want with a mansion? I mean, really, it's nice. I mean, I, I have a room over there in a the house. I, I have a home. But, I mean, I've got other things I'm doing. I'm not just sitting around my mansion. <laughs> and then, by the way, I, I, my wife asked me this. She said, will my mansion be near your mansion? <laughs> this is back when we first got saved. I mean, if, you know, you've got these questions. Well, I mean, if we got a mansion, it's just going to be a place that I spend the night. I just moving through. It'll be moving through, doing other things. There'll be a universe I'll be moving through. It, it'll never end. Amen. Amen. You can't put me on a cloud. You can't. I'm 85 now, and you can't. My wife can't get my foot nailed down now. <laughs> By the way, keep keep my wife in prayer. I I had to come to Thursday because of something with the airlines. And on Thursday night, she went to the emergency room. And when she talked to me, she said, John, it's good you went. Because you you wouldn't have gone. You wouldn't have gone if you were here for your regular Friday departure. She said, God wants you there with those people. You got something for those people. Now, that's a good woman. I got a good woman. I got a real good woman. Well, commerce, enterprise, industry is going to be taking place. That word honor... And, and, and then you take that word glory. Let me, let me read you a verse about glory. Genesis 31.1. Now this is, this is uh, uh, Laban's, Laban's sons talking. And he heard the words of Laban's sons saying, Jacob hath taken away all that was our father's, and of that which is our father's has he gotten all this glory. All the wealth of Laban that Jacob got it was called glory. The first place time glory is used in the Bible, it's used to describe wealth. And here we got it showing up in the book of, uh, of Revelations in the 21st chapter, and they're bringing the glory of the nations. What glory does the nations have that you could bring glory before God? I mean, you follow what I'm saying? They're bringing wealth. There's something of value they're bringing into that place. And they're going out and doing it again and again. And don't ask me to explain all of that to you because I can't. But this is a a verse I love. Moses knew the ways of God and Israel knew his acts. As long as you just know what God did, you're going to be wondering what's happening. But once you get to knowing why he does it and how he thinks, then stuff just starts rolling out of the book at you like that. So, so just, just don't pray for having, uh, knowing what, everything that's in the Bible. Just pray for understanding why God did what he does in the Bible. And then all of it will just come spilling out to you. Now, one, one more. You got another minute? Oh, well, let, me, let me give you. We got a couple more minutes? Okay, let me give you well, New English Translation. New English Translation, N-E-T. Uh, Genesis 21, 24. We were just reading it. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their... their, their Uh, grandeur into it. 25th verse. Its gates will never be closed by day and there will be no night there. 26th verse. They will bring their grandeur and the wealth 
of the nations into it. That's one translation of it, that uh, very scholarly translation to that particular translation. Now, Malachi. Let's go to Malachi. I didn't have it on my list, but we're going to get to Malachi, the third chapter. And when you get to Malachi 3, I'm going to give you some insight on something. When you read the 10th verse, bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in my house, and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. Now, let me say this. I've never met a man that had so much that he couldn't receive anymore. My son has a cute saying. When he's somebody with wealth, he'll say, if I had their money, I'd throw my money away. <laughs> but no, you've always got room for money. I mean, no matter how much there's, I mean, they always got some place you can put some more money. Right. Right. The problem is not having too much. The problem people have is not having enough. Right. 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 But anyway, what's wrong here? Well, there's eight words, seven or eight words here that are not in the original language. It's the most italicized verse of Scripture in the Bible. Here's what it says. We're going to leave out the words that are italicized. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in my house, and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that not enough. <laughs> Get finally teaching tithing and you have to go bring that verse up. God says, no, when you bring it in the tithe, that's not enough. Why would he say that? Do you understand what I'm saying about those words in there that are not in the, not in the original? These are words that were added by the translators. And in the, in, in, if you have an old King James, you said everybody ought to have an old King James somewhere. You can check those italicized words and you can see what's in the original and what's not. Now, what is going on here? Why would that not be enough? See, the Bible was not written verse here and then a week later Malachi wrote another verse and then in a few days he wrote another one. This, these are th flowing thoughts. They have a context. So let's get in the context and see what it is. If you back up to the, to the uh, uh, say the seventh verse. Even from the days of your father you've gone away from mine ordinances have not kept them. Return unto me and I will return unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. But they said, wherewith shall we return? Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me. But you say, wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. How many robberies are being reported? Two robberies, tithes and offerings. So when you get down here and you bring the tithe, he says that's not enough. There still has to be the offering. Now you say, Brother John, you're staggered. Just don't go into that. We, we, we get them tithing, then we'll go on into this other. No, that's, the issue is not to get money from you. The issue is to get money to you. See, you haven't given anything when you've tithed. You've just returned to the Lord what belongs to him. The tithe is the Lord. It's holy unto the Lord. It's holy money. I mean, and that holy doesn't mean completely. It means it, reverently. It's holy. It's holy. Let me show you something. Have I got five more minutes? Let me show you something. You know, how do you, how do you sanctify money? Have you ever wondered how you sanctify money? You get this dollar bill. Where has this dollar bill been? You know, there's, there's, there's drugs, drug traces of drugs on almost every bit of money. I mean, it's been in the hands of prostitutes. It's been in child pornography. Now you hand it to your kid. Here's your allowance. Daughter puts it away. Son puts it in his pocket. And I mean, you understand what kind of demons are in that money? Now, how do, you, how do you clean up money? Well, you circumcise it. You take 10% of it and you put it in God's house. Now you got sanctified money. Do you see that? Sanctified. Hand it to your son. Hand it to your daughter. It's not foul money anymore. Are you picking up what I'm trying to say to you? But now you've got this sanctified money, but now it says... <clears throat> with the same measure that you meet with all, it'll be measured to you again. Remember that? <clears throat> so if you give with a teaspoon, you get with a teaspoon. Now, windows of heaven are open, but now how, what's going to come out? <laughs> well, it's not decided by the tithe. It's decided by your offering. Oh, boy. You see? 
So it's not enough just to tithe. And I, if, I, if I was to leave that out, people would look at, they'd say, you could leave that out, Brother John, we'll get them tithing first, then we'll teach them that part. They don't have to trick people about this because once they do it, you can't get them to stop. I mean, I, ha I had a man and <clears throat> said, I just can't get this, I can't, can't get this tithing. I can't get this tithing. And I said, uh, I'll show you how to do it. You make me out five checks for your tithe and date it a week apart. I said, before I drop the last one in, you'll be a tither. He said, I, I said, do it. He, he didn't do it. I knew he would do it. If he did it, I knew it would have worked. Because when I started tithing, I didn't start and stop and start and stop. When I started, I started seeing something happening in my money. I had, I had enough money to get me a cup of coffee. I didn't have to just, uh, just drink water at lunch when I was on the job. Man, and then after a while, I, I started as a brick tender. I was mixing mortar with a hoe like years ago. And <clears throat> I had, finally had money. I got me a thermos. And then I'd have spaghetti. I had spaghetti last night, great spaghetti. Spaghetti in that thermos. Man, I mean, things started picking up. When I started tithing, things started picking up, man. I mean, my shoes now, I wouldn't get no shoes that'll destroy your feet anymore. You know, you can get, you can get shoes look like a million dollars down there at the Kmart. <laughs> and it just walk your feet flat. Man, and then, I mean, good things started happening. Then I had a little bit of car, better car. And then I, by that time, I, I was an apprentice bricklayer. I was learning to lay brick. My salary was going up. Then the, I, was, I was building wooden scaffold at home in my garage at night. And in about the third year, I was out contracting brick. Then I was driving a new car. Uh, you understand what I'm trying to say to you? Child of God, if you get started with this, you will not quit. Now tonight, we're going to talk about how to break the power of the spirit of debt. Line upon line, just like I did here. I didn't give, I gave you a little bit of my ideas about what's happening in the end of time, but I didn't give you my ideas about the fact that they're bringing wealth from the nations into the new Jerusalem. So tonight, we're going to take the devil of the woodshed. Break the power of the spirit of debt out of your life. Pastor, thank you. Oh, wasn't that great? Why don't you jump up on your feet in closing? Clearer this time, I think. I've made up my mind I'm never going to be broke another day in my life. It wasn't until I made that decision that I came out of poverty. I literally gave my way out of debt. You know? And, and this is what I want for the church. Wouldn't it be nice if we all were debt free. That, that'd be, how powerful if we had no mortgage, if, if you know what I mean, we got our tithing right now. Listen, I, I'm a firm believer. If everybody tithed, we, we would never have any, any needs. Matter of fact, we're a church that really doesn't have needs. We, we meet needs. It, but it wasn't until I made that decision in my mind that things began to change in my life. As you lift up your hands right now, I need you to make a declaration over your life. And this is for your family, for your children's children. You need to make this your mind up that you will never be broke another day in your life. Say it, I will never be broke a day in my life. Say it again, I will never be broke a day in my life. And then say it one more time for the Holy Ghost. Say, I'll never be broke a day in my life. In Jesus' name. Now clap those hands. Hallelujah. We are blessed. Say it. I'm blessed. Say it. I'm blessed. Say it one more. I'm blessed. And we are blessed to be a blessing. A blessing. I, you know, it, you know that scripture says better to give than to receive? When you start giving, you'll start seeing that's true. It is a blessing to be able to give something to somebody and watch their tears come on their face as you met a great need in their life. It's way better than getting your needs met. You know, we're always trying to figure out how we're going to meet our needs and you meet the needs of our family. That's a good thing, but God doesn't want us to live day to day like that. He wants us to be debt free and he wants us to be a blessing to other people. We are blessed to be another, a blessing to others. I pray as you lift your hands one more time in closing. Father, I pray that you sweep across this room. 
Put it in the heart of every man and every woman, number one, to be debt free, but to be a giver, God. Yeah. Hallelujah. Lord, I pray that this would be a church full of givers in Jesus' name. Let them meet the needs in these victory crews. I pray, Lord, just as this man gave this girl a car in the service, God, and that she's, she's getting her car this week. Lord, we are grateful for all the blessings that she had the money to fix the car. She received an amazing car, a Cadillac. And Father, I pray you continue to do these miracles every single week through your people, through your people, and let heaps come on their property. Let heaps come on their families. In Jesus' name, just say heaps. Now go and sin no more. God bless you. We, we'll love you. It's tonight, 7 o'clock. You don't want to miss it. It's a debt cancellation service. We're believing that God's going to get us all debt free.